Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Theo Gonzalez, and I'm the interim director of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. We are thrilled to, ha to have you joining us for this first program in our series, Colonasia, the future of Asian food in America. As you may already know, May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and there is no better way to mark the occasion than talking about and enjoying food. For things, for as many of you know, food is a window into another culture. It's a way to explore things that are new as well as things that are old. Through food, we can explore aspects of our lives that represent continuity with the past, as well as innovations in the present. Most importantly, food is a great way to bring us all together. And that is what has inspired a collaboration with Smithsonian Associates and the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Colonasia is a free series of programs that explores food legacies and the ways in which foodways of Asian America continue to change and enrich our lives. Tonight and in the next three programs to follow in May and June, we'll hear from chefs, food writers, food entrepreneurs, home cooks, cookbook authors, and other participants whose experiences span the complex spectrum of Asian American life. They'll discuss the successes and the challenges and future of Asian food in the Americas. The series received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, which is administered by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Before I turn it over to our guests tonight, I want to thank the supporters of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the Smithsonian Associates, and the Freer and Sackler Galleries. And if you'd like more information about how you can support all three of these organizations, we've put some links in the chat. Now, I'd like to introduce the curator of the series, Simone Jacobson, who will also be your moderator for the evening. She's a cultural connector. Simone Jacobson is also the co-owner of the DC Burmese American restaurant, Thami. With over 15 years of experience in arts and cultural management, she's contributed to large scale events like Illuminasia, a festival of Asian art, food and cultures, which drew 50,000 visitors to the National Mall for the Smithsonian's first Asian night market. The Peace Ball, featuring Solange and Esperanza Spalding at the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture, and Knights of the Raj at, at the Museum of Food and Drink in Brooklyn, New York. Her writing has been published in the Washington Post, Eater, Gawker, and Fusion. Please join me in welcoming Simone Jacobson. Thank you so much, Theo. Uh, I'm Simone Jacobson. I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you all this evening. Um, I know that all of you are familiar with Zoom, or many of you are familiar with Zoom. Uh, but before turning to our guests, I would like to just point out a few key features that uh, will apply to this evening and enhancing your virtual experience. You'll notice that the Q&A and the chat are disabled and only the speaker cameras and microphones will be turned on throughout the program. Um, the program's gonna wrap in about an hour and a half. And I just wanted to share with all of you a little bit about the vision for the series and why we've chosen the format that we uh, will be using this evening. So we are talking about the future of Asian food in America. And so I really wanted all of us to be able to eavesdrop and listen in with these experts. Uh, and so I'm sort of gonna take myself out of the way for most of the time. And um, I think that's important. I think it's really important for us to be able to hear from each of the speakers. So our program is also broken up into three distinct parts. In the first part of the program, you'll hear from three of the speakers. In the second part, another two. And then at the end, we'll all come back together to chat again. Um, you may also have noticed that this program includes an ASL interpreter. There will be two who will switch off throughout the program. And there's closed captioning. So if you prefer to hide the captions, you can click the CC or closed caption icon on your toolbar. You'll also see the chat box on the toolbar and that's where we're gonna be posting relevant information, links, social media, et cetera, throughout the program. And if you have a technical difficulty, you can post into that chat. 
Please, please, please take a moment after the program to complete our exit survey. We read every single comment. We sincerely value all of your feedback in this new forum of learning, in this new era of so many Zooms. I really appreciate you all being here and Zoom with us. I wish we could see all your lovely faces in person, but soon come, as they say. So now I have the honor of sharing a few words about our panelists today, starting with uh, the in imitable Grace Young, who is the accidental voice of Chinatown, the poet laureate of The Walk, an award-winning cookbook author, culinary historian, and filmmaker. She has been a fierce advocate for Chinatown, never more so than in her recent video series, Coronavirus, Chinatown Stories, produced in collaboration with videographer Dan An and Poster House, documenting the toll of the pandemic on New York City's Chinese community. She's also partnering with the James Beard Foundation on an Instagram campaign, hashtag Save Chinese Restaurants, all across the country. Grace is the recipient of James Beard Awards for her Walk Therapist comedy video and her cookbook, Stir Frying to the Sky's Edge. If you, like me, are a Grace Young fangirl, fanboy, fan human, we're all in for such a treat. Um, I know very few people who wear as many hats as Grace Young. Brandon Ju is the executive chef and owner of Mr. Ju's Moongate Lounge and Mama Hu Hu in San Francisco. Brandon has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and on Mind of a Chef, Ugly Delicious, Taste the Nation, and Vice Munchies. His honors at Mr. Ju's include one Michelin star, Bon Appetit number three on the 2017 Hot 10, San Francisco Magazine Chef of the Year, and James Beard nominations for Best Chef West, in 2018 and 2020. He is the co-author of the new cookbook, Mr. Jews in Chinatown, Recipes and Stories from the Birthplace of Chinese American Food, which is available for purchase from Politics and Prose, and we will drop a link in the chat. The third speaker in the first part of our program will be, as he described himself to all of us, the flushing expert, otherwise known as the garbage man of Chinatown. He's also the executive director of the Chinatown Bid and the Chinatown Partnership in LDC in New York City. He is the guiding force of the overall direction of both organizations, including strategic repositioning for the future, which we know is essential now more than ever. Wellington has a long track record of community engagement with decades of civic service. He is the first Asian American to serve on a community board in Queens and local LDC. These years of active community involvement led him to eventually be recruited to the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals, Queens Economic Development Corporation, and many, many others. He was born in Taiwan and grew up in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Brazil before coming to the United States to obtain an architectural degree. He worked for IM Pei and Partners for five years before creating his own architecture firm. Please join me in welcoming our first three speakers to the virtual stage, Brandon, Wellington, and Grace. Good evening, good evening. I see cameras popping on and mics popping on. And as you're joining us, um, I feel like I would not be doing my duty as a first generation Asian American daughter if I didn't start by asking you all the million dollar question. So I'm gonna stack two, and then I'm gonna slide out and have the pleasure of eavesdropping with all of you tonight. My first question for all of you, I hope you'll answer as you say hello to each other and to us tonight, is I really wanna know what you ate today. So what did you eat today? And I'd like to just start us off with actually something that Wellington shared as we were preparing for this event. The theme of tonight's event is saving Chinatown and our legacies. And so my question to get us all kicked off tonight and what I'd like to hear from all of you is are we saving? Are we preserving? Uh, are we passing on tradition? For you personally, what, is, what does this topic mean? What does it mean to save Chinatown and our legacies? So, uh, Simone, thank you so much for this uh, great uh, discussion. I understand it's a tremendous turnout, and I'm delighted to have the famous Grace Young. And Brendan, uh, hello from uh, San Francisco. I, I want to see how the Chinatown is doing over there. 
but uh, one correction, I did not start my architecture firm. I am an advocate of affordable housing. So with my partner, we started an affordable housing trying to mitigate the crisis of the homelessness and the issue of uh, adaptive reuse. But um, just to uh, get the conversation started, uh, in my architectural career, I got sidetracked because of, uh, during my last year of architecture school, my town started sputtering. And here's a, a young uh, student with a live patient on the sidewalk. And how do you resuscitate a town? And that town today turns out to be one of the largest Asian concentration uh, in North America called Flushing. And that's why the joke about being a Flushing expert, because I spent years uh, with so many volunteers, uh, so many dedicated community people to figure out every which way, whether it's doing the Flushing Fantastic Festival or doing other things. So, uh, but um, is, it is indeed a very interesting topic. Uh, I don't believe it's about saving as such, uh, because it is about a title. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, it is about that uh, the, the community is like a human being, it's a breathing, living organism. It has its cycles, ebb and flows. So just as you have birth, you have, uh, uh, maturity and then you have a decline. Uh, as Brendan will attest to San Francisco Chinatown, there are 17 other Chinatowns uh, that are historic core that are going through the pattern. But the food is important, extremely important, uh, because we're launching a campaign called Have You Eaten Yet for the May Asian Heritage? Not just purely on eating, uh, it is an expression of greeting and how are you? Are you okay? It is form of caring. So you can see how much emphasis, um, not just Chinese, uh, because this have you eaten yet is a form of greeting in many Asian countries, because through the thousands of years of uh, 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 locust infestation, famine, uh, conflicts, warfare, flooding, um, the Chinese never had it easy. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why you see the landscape uh, paintings of the mountain being carved out of every nook and cranny, uh, unlike the prairies of the Midwest, that every inch is being utilized to produce food. And that's why uh, the greeting of food is very, very important. So, uh, and it also reflects the different cuisine. So to answer Simone's question, and I'll pass it on to Ada, what did I have for lunch today? Well, I got treated by um, uh, Fred Brandt, the uh, landmark commissioner, and he took one of his brightest Chinese students, uh, who's now uh, working at Princeton uh, as some innovation lab. Uh, and we went to the name of the restaurant, uh, Shanghai Supreme. And we have wonderful soup dumplings, as well as uh, some vegetarian dishes, as well as some green vegetable, uh, a healthy balance. Uh, it's on 100 Ma Street. Uh, so I won't dominate the discussion. I will pass it on to the lady, Grace Yang, who's a culinary expert and uh, can tell us many more than, than I can. Thank you, Wellington. So it's my great pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, what I had for lunch is there's a fantastic restaurant in Chinatown on Bayard Street called Bo Key. And I love their, I think they call it country chicken. And it's a chicken that is braised uh, with soy sauce and cloves and five spice. And uh, I just made myself a bowl of noodles and had it with the uh, Boki chicken. Um, and I love Simone's question about what is the state right now? Are we saving Chinatown? And I will say that from a very personal standpoint, I was in Chinatown last year on March 15th, uh, the day that uh, I was in Chinatown hours before Mayor de Blasio announced the lockdown. And uh, at that point, Chinatown, 70% uh, of the owners announced that they were closing the following day because business had been so bad. Um, January, February, January, there were no cases of COVID uh, in America and yet, Chinatown in Manhattan, in San Francisco, across the United States, AAPI businesses were impacted. And um, I followed what was happening in January and February and so many businesses were operating at 30% of what they did pre-COVID, 40% pre-COVID. Um, 
And so that's why these uh, business restaurant owners had decided March 15th, before they even knew about what Mayor de Blasio had announced, that they had to close the following day. Um, and then we were in lockdown. And for the first time in my life, uh, I actually thought we could lose Chinatown. It was so unnerving. Um, end of March, April, and May, Manhattan's Chinatown looked like a movie set from a Hollywood Chinatown set. There were no pedestrians. There were no cars. There weren't even cars parked on Mott Street. It was a ghost town. Um, and so for myself, those images have haunted me all these months. And uh, I realized that I had taken Chinatown for granted, as I said. Um, and so for me, I, I realized that the city, the state, and the federal government were not coming in to help Chinatown and that we needed to do everything that we could to get any amount of foot traffic into Manhattan's Chinatown. And I saw what was happening in San Francisco's Chinatown. And we are not out of the woods right now um, with more people vaccinated, with warmer weather. This should be a new opening for Chinatown to uh, come roaring back. But here in New York City, the news is that restaurants throughout the rest of the city are coming back at 80% capacity. But in Manhattan's Chinatown, there are a lot of businesses that are still operating at 20 to 30% of what they did pre-COVID. And dinner time business for some restaurants um, is dead because of the anti-Asian uh, hate and crimes. And so I am really worried for Manhattan's Chinatown, for San Francisco's Chinatown, for AAPI businesses all across the United States. So I would definitely say that we need to save at this point and that we need to make a conscious effort to support our local Chinatowns, our local AAPI businesses in any way that we can. So I'm very curious to hear what Brandon has to say in San Francisco. Thanks, Grace. Yeah. <clears throat> um, hi, um, thanks for having me. I, I really, uh, I think I come today just from uh, a place of, uh, you know, in some ways very excited. We're opening our first day of indoor dining tonight. Uh, that's why I have to run down to the kitchen after this, um, uh, the webinar. And, um, but at the same token, uh, you know, just yesterday, um, there was a stabbing uh, on Market Street of two elderly um, Asian grandmas at, that um, are, are really, uh, these are reoccurring and um, really disheartening uh, events that are um, coming, to, coming to the surface again. Um, or maybe they have always been there. And um, so I, I come with a mix of, of emotions. Um, and, and I think my answer is that we will have to use many different kinds of um, ways to bring Chinatown back to uh, its glory. Um, some of that is saving parts of it. Uh, the legacy businesses that were here um, they have very uh, different challenges uh, in the form of um, how their business was run, uh, the, the customers that they rely on, uh, the travel, the, the proximity to downtown, uh, all those things have changed, um, the, the foot traffic here in Chinatown. Um, and some of them uh, might, might be in better situations, but most of them are in very dire situations um, as far as uh, just trying to persist during the pandemic. And like what Grace was saying, we experienced um, a slowdown in Chinatowns uh, months before the, the, the shutdown. Um, so we've been experiencing uh, a change in our uh, business and our consistency of, of what we had come to expect um, here in Chinatown. And, 
uh, it hasn't come back. Um, and and we, I, I think we opened the doors today at Mr. Jews knowing that, um, uh, you know, what we had before the pandemic, um, we, we are, we're trying to get ourselves back there as far as a business goes. Um, but we also, I mean, this is not just a business. It's not just a financial thing. This is a community. This is like um, for us too, like um, my, my employees here, um, they're, they're, they're much like um, extended family. Um, so taking care of them uh, emotionally um, as well. Um, it's, been, it's been really taxing uh, this last year. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, like kind of on the other, other end of it, like there is some optimism and there's strength um, in the community. Um, the city, uh, San Francisco recently, a couple months ago started a program that uh, helps Chinatown businesses specifically to serve um, uh, Chinatown residents. Um, that's been really big. That actually saved one of our legacy businesses here um, Far East Cafe from closing down completely. Um, but it's programs like this that we need, like the, the involvement of the city, the involvement of, of uh, the state, um, and, and really like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we, need, we need people coming to uh, frequent our businesses here. Um, uh, these, these consist of a lot of mom and pops and a lot of um, uh, immigrant owned businesses that this is their only business. This is the, this is the thing that they, they, they are, um, uh, really invested in, um, and supplies them of all they need. Um, uh, so, uh, being able to, uh, make a plan to come here, f uh, to Chinatown, um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a beautiful thing about Chinatown is there's, there's so much to, um, see and experience. And, um, yeah, I, I encourage you all to, uh, it, to, to come, to come to Chinatown, have a staycation in your own city. And, and this is a whole, uh, um, community here that, that is really in need of, of, um, of support. Um, and so any way you can give, um, uh, whether that's having lunch or dinner here or, or, um, uh, are contributing to some of the local um, uh, community um, funds that that's that's um, really appreciated. So, but I know that you know Wellington and Grace. We had a conversation earlier in the pandemic together. I mean, it might have been even a year from now, uh, where, where we were talking about some of what we had had really didn't know what we were going to be in for such a long haul. Um, I, I think um, this added uh, um, maybe hate crimes, ra racist attacks, um, these recent occurrences, um, I, I just wanted to know from, from your point of view, um, uh, some of the things that, that um, are uh, maybe coming to surface that, that are causing this and, and how can we, um, as, as a larger, uh, community help to quell some of these, um, feelings? Um, I don't know. I know it's a hard question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, it's an issue that I have thought about a lot and I don't recognize America right now. I don't recognize an America where I have to wonder whether or not we're safe walking on the streets of New York or San Francisco or two elderly grandmothers stabbed on Market Street is just not my America, but it, it is America. And um, it's impacting Chinatown in such a severe way right now. So many of the stores and shops are closing earlier because they want the employees to be able to get home safely. Um, and for all of you who know and love Chinatown, Chinatown is the place that you could go to late into the night. Chinatown is the neighborhood that was always hopping. And in Manhattan's Chinatown, we have two restaurants that were famous for being open almost 24 hours years ago. Wo Hop and Hop, Hop Key. And as recently, I think as 10 or 15 years ago, they were open till 1 a.m. 
with a line out the door. Um, so the restaurants are still open late right now, but uh, the business is not there. And San Francisco and Manhattan's Chinatown, unlike Chinatowns all around the country, unlike Flushing Chinatown, they're Chinatowns that are dependent on tourists. And we are missing in New York City, 66 and a half million tourists were here in 2019. So if we were even missing 1 million tourists, that would be a lot, but to be missing 66 and a half million is huge. I don't know what the number is for San Francisco. So um, I don't know what to do to stop the crimes. I don't know. I have no ideas at all about those things, except I think that we are stronger together. And when more people show up to Chinatown and show their love for their businesses, whether it's shopping in the markets for your food or shopping in the stores, and you can buy everything in Chinatown. In Manhattan's Chinatown, you name it and you can buy it and for a great price <laughs> and, the, and the food. So um, I, I think the only solution is for everyone to show up and we are stronger together. And I, I started a fundraiser uh, about three weeks ago to buy personal security alarms, which we're distributing to the elderly in Chinatown. And I can't even believe that we're doing this. Uh, five weeks ago, I didn't even know what a personal security alarm was, but we're giving them to the elderly, to workers, to residents. Um, these poor workers, most of them don't live in Chinatown, so they have a long, long commute to Brooklyn or Queens or wherever. And I think it's terrifying for them to be on the subway. Uh, when we gave them out a few weeks ago to some waitresses, they said to us, um, the restaurant closes at 10 and then we have to take a subway ride home alone. And uh, then we have to walk to our apartments. And the alarms are not the solution, but they at least make people feel a little safer because when you, um, when you um, activate the alarm, it lets off this screaming siren. So hopefully it would scare the, uh, the attacker or it would draw attention to other people. And there are many in the community who don't speak English. So even if they were being attacked, they wouldn't be able to say the words help. So at least the siren speaks for them. Um, so Wellington, I'm curious to hear your, your response. I couldn't even agree more, both of what you just said, Brendan and uh, Grace, because uh, you know I shouldn't be sitting here because the same stabbing uh, mm -hmm. that occurred yesterday to a five-year-old, uh, am I to understand correctly? Uh, I personal witness a stabbing with an eight inch butcher knife right in front of my face, uh, within three feet of me, uh, and a young man, uh, luckily, uh, you know, or unfortunately got, you know, uh, out of the blue, a stranger just in front of my face, plunge an eight inch knife into his back. And I didn't even realize that that was a knifing. Uh, and I hope he's okay. It's going to take him a long, long time. And I, I pray for his fiance as well. Uh, but that shows you how close it is home to Grace. Uh, right now, the issue is safety first. Uh, as to your point uh, and to Grace's point as well, we didn't just hit one virus. We hit a second virus, which has no vaccine, which is dating back to the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, right? As soon as the earthquake happened, they want to eradicate Chinatown and move it elsewhere. So that the system that led to the creation of Chinatowns everywhere is still there. And it's unfortunate. And I, I, uh, I'm hoping that this country is what Bill Moyers always uh, 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 claims that it is an ideal in process that we will get there. And so this is something that uh, unless we can deal with it, Right now, at this moment, Grace is absolutely right. The restaurants are closing. Some of them are closing as early as eight o'clock. Some are totally gone by nine. The weeknight traffic, you know, as Grace says, is not just about the, uh, the tourism, it's about the local visiting. Uh, and I saw the actor Daniel Day Kim's uh, interview yesterday on the network news. His wife is afraid to go daytime shopping. Now, this is daytime shopping not coming to Chinatown. 
And so until we can stem the second virus, and uh, I am going to, I already asked for initiation of a new initiative called 694. For those of you that fear Asian, that blame us, that think the Asians are going to take over the country, all of the Asians combined is 6% for God's sake of this country. 94% of you need to speak up. You need to intervene. You need to document. You need to detract the harasser, the attacker, uh, you know, and, and delegate, call the police, block the door, right? Because to Grace's point, their lady being spat on, being harassed, and when the uh, police asks, what did they curse you in? She cannot tell you because she doesn't speak English. And so, and 68% of the victims are Asian women. So if the if Asian women are fearful to come out in such a number, we are fighting a losing battle. And there's a third issue, which is they're afraid to get caught in the crossfire, like we have witnessed. And so this is a very, very serious. So I'm pleading to the rest of America, have no fear. We're not here to take over the country. We're just like everyone else, trying to make a better life. Like my mom took us across the ocean to say, son, you deserve a better future with your brother. And that's all that is. It is representative of every single immigrant, unless you're Superman that flies over the ocean and, and, and landed here before the, in, and the native uh, uh, Americans did. We are all looking for a better life. And so what we have to share is a culture of 4,000 years for a continent that landed 400 years ago. So the cuisine that we can share with you are fabulous. I'm always amazed at looking at the cuisine show from the TV, the Chinese channels, the Asian channels. And that's why Anthony Bourdain and all of these foodies love Asia because you go there and you're mesmerized mm -hmm. how foods are prepared, how food are shared, how food are, are communal. And it's also to the other point what most people forgot, it's a giant job engine. It's a giant job engine produce the, the opportunity for students, the earlier generation, early Americans, uh, Chinese students, all work in restaurants in one form or another, whether as a busboy, waiter, bartender, maitre d', kitchen helper. It was not just a job, it was discipline, training. It's a very good, so I have to commend you, Brendan, for producing this type of, continue to evolve the food. We can remember the, 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 the prior years of the 1906 San Francisco, the chop suey, the chow mein, and also the uh, Susie Wong's world of the 1960s, and then the Sichuan craze, the Hunan craze, the Vietnamese craze, and then the, uh, the, uh, the, the sushi craze, and we are evolving still. And I, I commend you for, for the, all the exploration and, uh, and, and the thing. But, Far and foremost, as as the uh, as as Gate, uh, Grace said correctly, if we want 67 million tourists to return, it's been well documented by the hotel association president in the Crane's interview. Clean and safe. You got to assure this is not the 1960 New York. This is not looting. This is not rioting. This is not anything goes. And so that is fundamental. So I, 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 I want to just also point out is that we are also, the good news is Lower Manhattan relies on the 300,000 workers on a daily basis. Luckily, the city finally, yesterday for the first time, released 80,000 workers to come back to work. We are still short a quarter million every day. Those numbers cannot be made up by the little gift cards, the GoFundMe's, we need massive numbers. And so I do believe that the way that we're gonna go about this is very similar to the Great Depression. We're gonna to have to go through a multi-year recovery pretty, very much like the 1918 pandemic, which took multiple years. So, uh, and what we can give is encouragement. 
we can give assistance like all the teams that are providing. I had to thank thousands of volunteers that are willing to figure out every which way, the yellow whistles, the, um, mm. the self-defense uh, teaching classes, the patrol, the guardian angels, the auxiliary police, the undercover cops that are in Chinatown and, and, and things like that. But until we can band together, until we are realizing that attack on one is attack on all the others, we're not safe. And so I, I, I am optimistic that just as the San Francisco Chinatown recovered from the 1906, recovered from the 1918 pandemic, recovered from the 1929 disaster, recovered from World War II, that there will be a new era for us to deal with, but we need to adjust. There's no question about it that we need to do a multi-pronged approach. And one of the things that we need is that we need to lend liquidity. I'm asking all the banks that are sitting on billions of dollars of cash, earning tremendous amount of interest, extend the loans. The restaurant industry alone suffered $240 billion this past year. We need you to extend the lifeline by spreading out for the tough fighters. I'm amazed at how resilient the small businesses are. They hang in there, they open till nighttime, even knowing that they may be robbed, they may be attacked. They hang in there. Some of them modify into a supermarket. Some of them immediately turn into a takeout. We know that because normally the Chinese traditional restaurants are all communal. It's meant to be shared. It's not to be in a soggy bag delivered to your apartment 45 minutes later. It is a basic human experience. Hence why we have Lazy Susan, why we have dim sum go karts with the steam underneath it. So I, I'm optimistic because the oldest Chinatown is 400 years old and it's in the Philippines. So I do believe that it is incumbent upon all of us because every town in America that has a a population of 50,000 and more has a Chinese restaurant. You, can, you go to the Canadian Rockies, right in the middle of the railroad station, you pop out of it, there's a Chinese restaurant. And so if you want to enjoy good food, life is too short as some of the volunteers are saying, launching a campaign. You don't need to spend the waste time hating. Enjoy life. And so I do believe that we have to go through a base camp approach Little by little, we need to figure out a way to go. We intend to take to the airwaves. So before one, that I'm going to implore you that the 94% of you must take the 5D training. Learn how to defuse the tension like every police officer had to do. You need to detract the deer. Uh, just step in between the two of them, just fumbling, just say, what time is it? Do you, does anybody know what happened? Why do you need to fight with one another? Diffuse the tension, delegate, document. We need your help because we are a minority, pure and simple. And we, without the numbers, you're getting the best bang for the buck in Chinese restaurants. We have the lowest cost per plate. So we depend on volume, tremendous volume. So I do see that the thing that is truly needed, as been mentioned by both of you, is the true PPP, the other PPP, the public-private partnership. With the right public policy, I wish Franklin D. Roosevelt is alive today. He would take the helm and just say, God damn it, here's what we will do. The banks, if you help Chinatown, these merchants last these five years so that they can get back to the 2019 level, give them low interest we will give you the assurance that even if some of them default, we will back you up, like the FDIC. You're sitting on billions of dollars that is not being tapped. And what is the bank giving you as interest? 0.045, right? Can we do better? Absolutely. So I do believe that with the right leadership, with the right packaging of public policy, with a mini Marshall plan that can be deployed, there are many solutions. And just as the San Francisco Chinatown survived, I, I'm very, very optimistic that no one is going to abandon a 5,000 year old experimentation that is fabulous cuisine that we cannot enjoy, enjoy the campfire. Brandon, um, that was great, Wellington. Brandon, I wanted to ask you a question 
one of my uh, all time favorite stores uh, in San Francisco's Chinatown is the Walk Shop, been around for over 54 years. And um, I heard sadly that a few days ago it was vandalized and that Tain Chan, the owner, has started a GoFundMe uh, not to pay for the damage to her gate and to her window, but to uh, buy security cameras. And she's going to give the money to the Chinese Merchants Association in Chinatown. And, um, and they should work with the San Francisco Police Department to um, install security cameras in Chinatown. Is, is this something uh, that you think is going to help Chinatown? The, the addition of security cameras? I think it won't hurt for sure. Um, I think it, it helps to document like what Wellington was saying is, you know, um, cause we need that. Um, and I think for a long time, uh, our community has been targeted because uh, a lot of people think that we're weak or we won't speak up. And that um, uh, I think, uh, I think having these cameras will be able to help us by just saying, we're not asking for anyone to give any, uh, uh, like personal story or, or like what happened or what they witnessed. Um, we have, we have like cameras to, to, to do that. Um, but I think I've been really encouraged by seeing how this has um, maybe created, uh, our community stronger vocally um, because I think a lot of uh, my elders in my family, a lot of them were were not very willing to to talk um, because they were scared, uh, even in, in in you know before the pandemic about um, uh, being involved with 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 anything that could potentially cause disruption, um, and I think. Um, I think that's changing and I think that's changing for the better for our community that we um, we are being vocal and we're being um, I think stronger um, as a community and saying that we're not going to put up with this anymore we're not going to let this happen to us anymore and um, and that we are going to be looking out for each other um, just for at least personal safety um, but Tane like uh, you mentioned the walk shop like she has not been vandalized in the, the all the years that she's been opened until now um and so that that already tells you i think that that um there's a desperation here um uh and there's some of that desperation into either people thinking that um that we're easy targets here um or that we won't say anything um or we'll just let it happen and move move on, and and that's not gonna. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm happy that I think there's a uh, a groundswell of of um, strength, uh, and and that we are not going to allow this to happen. Um, and whether that's by documenting and showing uh, what's happening to people, um, or we're gonna be, um, you know protesting in the streets and, and just saying this is this is it this is enough like, like we can't let this happen anymore and having more people be aware of the challenges that we face um as as immigrants still um as immigrant community and um i think um seeing that uh that strength um i think for for me it feels feels very new i i know that there's um, there's been uh, a lot of persevering that that the community has gone through over the years, over the centuries, and um, but but I think um, this uh, at least present day um, feels feels like um, that this movement is something that is going to um, really impact our our younger generation in a way that that um, I'm hoping uh, similarly uh, like. Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement uh, that that guys also is is being being uh, the need of um, support. 
So I'm sliding back into the conversation uh, like a nosy eavesdropper over here. And I think that um, some of our friends at the Smithsonian were sharing at the beginning of our conversation. Uh, and so I know that I'm not alone in saying that, um, you know, a lot of us are here holding back really strong emotions, you know, tears and heartbreak um, as we talk about these things, you know, is very urgent and it's uh, it's happening right now. And so for me, you know, when I listen to all of you talk, I know that it's very easy for us to get wrapped up in uh, what's happening right now because it's so personal and so uh, urgent as it pertains to safety first, as Wellington has said. Um, but also, I'd like to just sort of start to steer us. We're going to invite our other panelists in a few minutes. But maybe each of you, if you could just share um, a minute or so on the topic. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of um, outreach on the part of restaurants. I know that for my own restaurant, we asked people to buy gift cards. We asked them to buy merchandise. And I think that um, Daphne and Vic will talk a little bit more about that. But as we wind out of this conversation, and then we'll bring you back on uh, with us in a few moments after we chat a little bit with Vic and Daphne, whose responsibility is it to help, to save, to preserve, to aid specifically Chinatown restaurants? Because we know that Chinatowns are cultural hubs. There are other businesses that are essential in Chinatown, but Chinatown restaurants, who's responsible? Um, maybe each of you could just share a little bit with us on that. Let's start with Grace. Um, so uh, whose responsibility? Well, as I said before, um, Manhattan and San Francisco's Chinatown are so dependent on tourists and the tourists aren't there right now. I think they are coming. I think uh, perhaps European tourists and Asian tourists won't be allowed back into the country soon, but at least American tourists are coming back this summer as the weather warms up. Uh, but as I said earlier, I completely took Chinatown for granted. I use Chinatown. I would go into Chinatown pre-COVID. Now in reflecting about my behavior, I will say that I use Chinatown for my benefit whenever I needed groceries, whenever I was in need of a great meal. And then I just slipped away. Um, and this year I reflected on the fact that I needed to help Chinatown. Chinatown was on life support. And so I have done everything in my power to try and help Chinatown. And it means introducing myself to owners, workers, waitresses that I've always seen, that we've always nodded to each other. And in a very small way, I have become a part of the community and that has enriched my life and made my life so much better. But I think all of us who love Chinatown and Asian American Pacific Islander businesses, we have to show up, we have to bring them business, we have to assure them that we are there for them. Um, that question, I think, um, part of me, just because I'm, I'm running a restaurant too, um, I think the responsibility uh, lies with our government to qualify Chinatown and our, you know, Chinatown businesses as worth saving. Um, I think because I'm also uh, have have kind of been involved with IRC, um, who is they've been amazing during this whole time uh, to just be. Um, uh, able to push the politicians into understanding the, the special needs of restaurants. Um, we don't have that in, in Chinatown for Chinatown businesses and, and mom and pops. So until our government and our politicians really start to understand the, the dynamic of uh, these mom and pop restaurants, these legacy businesses, what they mean to the culture of, of Chinatown, uh, until we get that kind of qualification, um, unfortunately, it's left to our diners and our fans and, and the people that believe that immigrants 
and immigrant communities deserve success here in America. That's, that's unfortunately who is now responsible to save our restaurants here in Chinatown. Um, I'd like for it to come from both, but at this point, I, I just don't see enough government involvement in, in helping um, uh, these very, you know, uh, specifically needed, um, uh, you know, Chinese restaurants here, or, or even just businesses in Chinatown that have been affected. So, um, so yeah, I mean, until then, we, we really need our diners and, and, and really the, the supporters of, of Chinatown to uh, continue to, to, to help us. Um, yeah, at the me, we say we got us because really I think that that's something that we're all realizing is that nobody's coming to save us, you know? And I think that's what I'm hearing Wellington talking about too and Grace with the whistles and the mutual aid. Um, and I know we're gonna get into that a little bit with Daphne and Vic too, but you know, just as a, as a rallying cry for hope for us all, I mean, even with or without, you know, as long as we've been here, as long as we've been in the United States and uh, in Chinatowns and in other immigrant communities, we got us. Yeah, Simon, that, uh, that's absolutely, uh, and also to echo everyone's uh, uh, keen insight, is that at the end of the day, uh, if you want to enjoy the type of food, enjoy the type of small uh, uh, eatery to exist, uh, all of us are responsible. Uh, and the unfortunate situation, and that's why government plays an even greater role. That's why I'm grateful for you know, New York City has a Department of Small Business Services and all the all the uh, uh, programs they're trying to do and as much as they can. Is that at the end of the day, during this bottleneck crunch time period, I cannot grow extra stomachs to make up for the differential. I cannot, like a camel, grow extra salmon stomachs to say, Brendan, I really love your food. I'm going to have 12 meals today instead of three. That's impossible, right? Uh, and so, uh, and I so- I wish you would, well, I, wish you would. I, I can't wait to come to San Francisco to see your latest creations. Uh, but the reality is there's no substitute for the type of leadership program that can extend the lifeline. And I do believe that you need to extend the credit line, the liquidity, so that during this a bottleneck where all the things are coming together and all the bills are coming due a year and a half. There's, by the way, uh, Grace is right. There's some restaurant in Chinatown today that since March of last year till now has not reopened. Imagine what, the, what kind of taxi bill is taking. I mean, imagine just the rent alone multiplied by 15 months. Uh, and the real estate tax, the heating bill, the insurance, as Brendan knows very well and Grace knows well, they are fixed costs. Regardless you open the restaurant or not, those fixed costs is there. And so multiply that to 2024 is what we're confronting. So we really need to put together a plan and I'm going to ask everyone as much as your mere presence of even one extra body, just the fact that you are there lends to the aura that there is movement, there is energy, mm -hmm. there is people interested, there are people interested in coming to your town, that you are not alone. So I have always said one extra customer is better than no customer. But at this moment, we, we need massive amount of aid. Wow, on that note, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna invite uh, Wellington and Grace and Brandon to just take a, a big breath and a pause with us. Um, I have the pleasure of announcing our next uh, set of panelists. And um, I hope that when uh, Daphne and Vic are able to join us that we can build on this conversation um, because it's, it's an important one. And so I'm going to invite uh, some additional speakers to join us in just a few moments. Uh, Vic Lee is the co-founder of Welcome to Chinatown in New York City, a grassroots initiative to support Chinatown businesses and amplify community voices that generate much needed momentum to preserve one of the city's most vibrant neighborhoods. And uh, unfortunately, Jennifer Tam is gonna be unable to join us tonight. Um, she's also featured in this stellar bright photo in the middle of your screens. Uh, she's dealing with family emergencies. So we are fortunate to have Vic Lee with us here representing 
um, representing Welcome to Chinatown and its entirety. And um, Vic leads business operations and development for the organization in addition to her full-time work. So this is a labor of love. We are so, so thrilled to have her with us this evening. Her guest is going to be Daphne Wu, leading the Cut Fruit Collective, formerly known as Save Our Chinatowns, a grassroots initiative raising funds for Oakland and San Francisco Chinatowns driven by art, community, and shared love of food. And recently she collaborated with three Oakland Chinatown businesses and six artists to write and publish a recipe zine, Have You Eaten Yet? Back to our original question. Born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, Daphne devotes her time to building community through creative storytelling mediums. Her explorations have led to projects in food, design, film, writing, and small business entrepreneurship. And I read today that the now Cut Fruit Collective, uh, formerly um, Save Our Chinatowns, has raised, seems like, over $70,000. Um, they are doing incredible work. Very excited as we're looking forward towards the future uh, with some, you know, heartache, but also with some hope. Uh, please join me in welcoming Vic and Daphne to the second part of our program this evening. Hi, Daphne. Hi, hey. Victoria. Hi. Hi there. Thank you so much for having us. Welcome, welcome. Um, as we're transitioning into part two of three of our program, I do just want to pause um, and say thank you so much to Jan and Helen for this incredible interpretation. Um, our first business was inside of a market next to uh, America's leading uh, university for the deaf and hard of hearing. And so um, I'm always, always so grateful when we have live interpretation. So round of applause for those two while we're in a second pause. Um, but I'm going to ask you two the same question to kick us off. Um, I want to know what you ate today. But then also, um, I would love it if you all could give a little bit of background for our audience members that might not know uh, about the work that you've been doing. And tell us kind of, I know Daphne specifically just switched over to a whole new name, a whole new rebrand for the organizing work. But if you could tell us a little bit about where you've been and where you think you're going, or if you know where you're going with the, with the organization and kind of what you've seen change and where you're headed with the work in your respective Chinatowns on the opposite ends of the country. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So uh, today I had a bowl of noodles with some delicious Chinese pickles, very easy, simple. <laughs> um, yeah, very easy, simple meal. Um, and um, so yeah, I'm, I'm representing Cut Fruit Collective. We are formerly known as Saver Chinatowns. Um, we are a grassroots organization using art, uh, creating art for uh, AAPI community care. Um, to unpack that a bit more, it's, we are, we're a group of artists and designers. Um, we're trying to rally folks using this art work. Um, and specifically, we're, uh, our main goals are to support AAPI artists, amplify AAPI activists, uh, invest in vulnerable AAPI communities, and then, um, and you know, more recently, it, it, uh, tying in with the, the name change and evolution, uh, we really feel like it's necessary to build coalitions across AAPI communities. And so, um, yeah, I guess a quick kind of uh, explanation for the, the name change, we are, uh, or for what Cut Fruit stands for, um, as many in the Asian diasporas um, can maybe recognize for so many, uh, Cut Fruit symbolizes a love language. It's, it's a very quiet gesture <laughs> of care. Uh, it can you know, speak so many, uh, speak volumes without saying as many words. And so, um, so that we wanna bring that energy and, and um, and devotion to the work that we're doing. So Vic, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Daphne. Um, so for lunch today, I had leftover dim sum from Jing Fong. Um, I had specifically, I had lo bako or turnip cake, um, still delicious a few days later. And uh, so I represent Welcome to Chinatown. Um, Welcome to Chinatown is 
a grassroots hyper-local organization. We're focused on Manhattan Chinatown. Um, our mission is around community preservation through empowering our small business owners to thrive independently. The reason we focus on small business owners, we, we believe that they're the heart of the community. Once you start to lose small businesses, um, New York City becomes a little bit more homogenous. It loses its character. And um, these small businesses, they're, they're really integral to ethnic enclaves. They shape um, experiences. They shape identity. You know, that's the case for me. When I think about my Asian American identity, I think about, I think about Chinatown and those businesses that I grew up with. Um, so we're, um, right now, we're really focused on um, business resources, support, and grant making. Um, we started as a, xenoph um, as a organization that rose from xenophobia when uh, COVID first started. And for us, so to date, we've raised one and a half million dollars. And um, we're committing that by the end of 2021, we will have distributed a million dollars in grants alone. So it's a large undertaking, um, but we're really excited. And we're also now thinking about what the future of Chinatown looks like and how we support our small business owners to thrive independently. And that's gonna be around sustainability. So how can we make sure that we're also shifting the narrative from COVID recovery to sustainability so that this doesn't become a cyclical process for our small businesses of um, experiencing dire need. So that's um, about us. And um, I guess Daphne, I want, what really struck me is um, you mentioned about amplifying AAPI voices, using arts and your skill set to do that. Can you tell me a little about yourself? Because I also think it's awesome that we're two um, two younger AAPI women that are you know representing change. So I, I'd love to hear about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I, I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, I have family with roots in San Francisco Chinatown and and other enclave communities around the Bay Area. I myself grew up in, in South Bay. Um, and I think, um, you know, in terms of coming to this work, um, I've been working on just many random creative projects. I think a lot of us in our generation, uh, you know, we're, we're exploring our identity as well, um, our heritage. And, and so a lot of the projects I've been working on in the past few years have been around that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like Simone had mentioned, I, um, I've dabbled in writing, in filmmaking, in uh, events, in food and beverage, and, and, um, and it all kind of seems to cum accumulate <laughs> with what I'm doing right now. Um, and I, I, I do want to shout out um, our founder, Jocelyn Tsai. She's an Oakland-based artist. Um, she was really the one who, who created all of this and uh, started the movement. And, um, and she had actually seen, I think, you know, her peers in New York, um, as well as organizations like yours spring up. And that was a huge inspiration um, for her and wanted to bring that to the Bay Area um, with her own, you know, unique set of skills and, and talents um, to be able to, to communicate that with others. And so, um, and so, yeah, and, and I was so inspired by what she did and, and joined on and, um, and I, you know, we, all of us on our team feel really strongly about using art as a way to communicate these complex, you know, ideas to, to move people, to move them to act. Um, and so, um, and we've been really grateful that our, our audience and our community has been so supportive and, um, and are reaching out actually. And, and that's actually been the most inspirational, uh, just you know, seeing all of our audience start creating their own fundraisers based on their own talents and their own skills. And, um, and so it's been amazing to be able to amplify all these Asian American uh, creatives um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's a bit about my background. What about yours? How did you get involved? Um, personal background, I work in the travel hospitality industry. I manage a corporate travel program. Um, it, Chinatown is just, I, I don't think I realized this until maybe like my late 20s um, about how much a community can represent identity. You know, it, I think for growing up Asian American, particularly the conversations that are going on between my friends or what I see in social media, that 
with API hate is you, you never felt quite American enough or you don't feel Asian enough. And I look back on my experiences of Chinatown and that's where I learned things like tradition. You know, I, I learned with my family, like, why am I going to the temple? Why are we celebrating not just Lunar New Year, but certain holidays like Qingming, um, which, you know, um, being able to honor those who pass. And also, of course, being rooted in food, like walking by in community. And I remember very fondly, like my grandmother who was there, you know, um, who lived there, I would go to the bakery, pick up her favorite goods, and then after go grocery shopping. Like Chinatown was a place that um, it has its own ecosystem and um, it, it represents so much of now thinking, if I wanna raise kids, what is going to, what's going to be there? Um, and I felt during COVID, seeing all of these shuttering gates and, and storefronts that, it, I don't know if, if it's going to exist and it has the real potential to accelerate gentrification that was going to happen. Um, so, you know, I, I took what I, I knew best and like organizing and, and working on things like change management, um, just basically building stuff from the ground up, um, got together with my really good friend, Jen, and we just tried to launch like a gift card platform just to be able to say, hey, how can we um, help businesses get cash? But the problem with gift cards is it's, it's one and done. Um, so that's where we started to evolve, ask questions of small business owners, gain their trust, and launch a bunch of different initiatives from purchasing catering, bulk catering, to our grant making, um, to launching our own merchandise line. But you know how you mentioned with arts, um, I'm a terrible artist. Like our first website was so awful. Um, luckily, we have a really great head of creative now who takes that on. But I, again, you know, I, I took my own skill sets and figured out, okay, what could I do? How could I apply it? And it goes the same for our volunteers. It's, it's made getting involved or like the word activism, I think a lot easier because it's not this daunting thing. It's like, what am I good at and how can I apply it to social good? Yeah, that totally makes sense. I, I think myself, um, like people have asked, are you an activist? And I, I am... A reluctant activist. I think that's how how uh, Grace Young also described herself. I'm well, not reluctant, but just like I'm new to this, um, or I'm new to this form of activism. Um, and what's interesting is I think it is it is a new form of activism. Um, so what we're building today is it's grassroots. It's rooted in storytelling. It's rooted in in cross generational, multi generational. Um, you know, connections and community building. And so um, we're working, but I do also want to call out that some, so much of what we're doing has been done before. I mean, not so much, there's been a foundation for what we're doing. And, and so much of what we want to do in the future is really amplify the work that is being done on the ground. Um, and we've been able, we've been so fortunate to partner with so many organizations um, in Oakland uh, and across San Francisco um, to be able to amplify the work. Um, and, and I think that's, that's kind of the new layer that we're bringing is how do, we, how do we draw attention in a way that's sustainable, in a way that's not gentrifying either. It's, it's, it's actually, I think it's, you know, cultivating curiosity, cultivating appreciation, um, pride, you know, for an audience and, and, uh, and like Grace was talking about earlier, maybe our audience might actually mostly be outside of Chinatowns, but um, in order to, to think about how to save or, you know, how to, how to build and, and uh, uplift Chinatown communities, you have to have a dialogue with the surrounding community. You have to have an ongoing connection um, outside of that. And so art to us seems like a, it seems like a, a I don't know, for, for our team, it, it's maybe the easiest way for us to express that and, and to, to build that connection. But anyways, I, I am so just in awe of all the work that your team has done and you know how you've mobilized. Can you share a little bit more about, you know, what was that like in the beginning? and for us, we're, we're such a small team and, and we're now just starting to grow because we've realized, oh, I think people really care about <laughs> our point of view. Um, but I, I'd love to hear, yeah, more about that on your end. Thanks for that. Um, 
yeah, you know, I think this the silver lining of, of everything that's been going on is, is to your point that you're, you're seeing people saying how much they care. Um, with Welcome to Chinatown, we're a, we're about a year and almost a year and a half now, um, including our alum volunteers, we have a team of 70 plus. Um, so we've scaled up pretty quickly. The growing pains are real. Um, and when we first started with the gift card platform, it was really hard. We were going to businesses. It was right when the city was about to shut down. And um, although I, I've lived in Chinatown for the, the past decade, I visited every weekend. I don't know the business owners as intimately as I should. I love what Grace said earlier about engaging in dialogue and, and talking to waiters more, or talking to your favorite shopkeeper. Um, I admittedly didn't do that enough. And when we were going around, you know, trying to say like, hey, we want to help you. Of course, there's that natural element of, of trust that you have to build. And particularly, I think for Asian culture, there's I mean, it's even harder to talk about, right? Like finances, like you, you don't read people like an open book like that. Um, so we knew we had to like really revisit our approach and um, our next initiative that we did after we're like gift cards aren't going to work. Um, we fundraised money to place uh, bulk catering orders where we could help to support the maybe like 20, 30 restaurants that are open in March of 2020, use those meals and donate them out to the central workers of New York City just to say thank you for everything that was going on. Um, slowly, like there's, there's definitely challenges with Chinatown as um, for Manhattan's Chinatown, a lot of places are still cash only. So even paying, I had to go and, and pay them and use that time to say like, hi, like, how are you doing? Tell me a little bit what, about what's going on. Um, through those conversations, learning that rent was piling up, they weren't getting breaks from small, from landlords, um, either because landlords weren't relenting or the landlords couldn't, because there's a lot of small property owners. Um, and then the next phase is taking those learnings of, well, okay, you, as much as we're helping you with these catering orders, you need um, you need more funds in order to cover these mounting overhead costs. And that's where we started our grant program. Um, so it has been a lot of active listening, a lot of dialogue and engaging with community stakeholders too, like talking with you know Wellington, who's a great wealth of knowledge and, and grace. Um, and um, I think that that's, that's really shaped one of our core values, like always listening and like, how can we have our approach with empathy? And I think that's really key for help, for ensuring that we're gonna have the right solutions for cultural enclaves like Chinatown. Um, so yeah, for, for sure, like a lot of what you said in, in your approach and you're doing it through art, like really resonated with me. Yeah, yeah, I think that similarly for us, um, you know, we, we decided to, to really devote a lot of attention and, and uh, to Oakland Chinatown because it just, it doesn't get as much support and help um, and love. And so um, similarly, you know, having to, to build those connections, uh, build trust with small business owners and community members, that's, that's been a lot of, of what we've been trying to do. And, and I think funnily enough, you know, the way with the name Save Our Chinatowns originally, it makes a lot of sense. It's a little easy for us to, to explain what we do. Um, and now with the shift, it's it's like, well, you know, we we still talk about what we're doing or what we've done in the past, um, but uh, but essentially like we are shifting to this new name in order to really capture and, and bring the energy that we need for the, the future of communities like Chinatown. Um, and I guess specifically for Oakland Chinatown, I, uh, um, something that's different between Oakland versus San Francisco and New York is that it's actually not reliant on, uh, not as reliant on tourist traffic. And so it is a community uh, or a lot of the small businesses there really serve the residents um, and neighboring communities or folks from neighboring communities. And so, um, so that's been an interesting, you know, difference to see um, with Oakland Chinatown, all of the all of the challenges that everyone has mentioned in the past or you know before are very much uh, still affecting Oakland Chinatown. Um, and you know it, it's been heartbreaking to see, yeah, all of that uh, impact such a small community. but I think overall, um, the businesses that we've spoken to, they're, you know, we've we've been trying to 
find what exactly they need the most. And really that's, you know, that's foot traffic. They need people coming in and that's where we have been able to, to do a bit more help, you know, storytelling, connecting folks, um, bringing a bit of the urgency um, to our audience um, to come and support these businesses, tell stories about businesses that, you know, people may have not even thought of uh, visiting. Um, and, and overall it's, it's like just cultivating appreciation again. Um, I think that's, that's a big part of, of what we're doing. So here I am jumping in like the like the little big sister in the convo. Um, and you know, Daphne and Vic, as we've talked before tonight's event and as we've been discussing this evening, both in our smaller conversations and we'll come back to as a larger group. I noticed that, you know, both of you and Grace and a lot of us, I mean, I would include myself, my mother, my family, my business partner, the other people I know in the DC restaurant industry. Uh, we've all been called not just to be activists, but to do a lot of roles that we didn't plan to do, uh, whether that's trying to understand, you know, federal treasury rules or loans, as Wellington was talking about, trying to be infectious disease specialists because the uh, requirements and and um, and guidance has been so sporadic and not uniform and standard from city to city and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So I know that a lot of people that are listening in, we were talking earlier about, you know, we got us, um, and I think that's still true, but a lot of people listening in, I know that they're wondering, what can they do, right? And so as the two of you have been working over a long period of time, specifically in Chinatowns, if you had to say maybe two or three actionable things, right? Because at the end of the day, what makes you all activists is that you're taking action and you have other work, whether that's personal projects or professional work. And so obviously this passion is really coming from your heart. Can you share with us a couple of like two to three things, like I could leave this today and I can in my city, whether or not there's a Chinatown to support Asian Americans and specifically restaurants and food businesses, what are two or three actionable things that folks can do? And what's your appeal to them? Why should they do it? Yeah, I can start. Um, first is, you know, we kept saying a lot of the word like amplifying. Um, it's so important to use your own platform of social media and share the stories of small business owners. I think what was like most heartbreaking during COVID um, seeing a lack of humanization of Chinatown small business owners and that they were viewed as transactional. Like you're coming to the neighborhood because you're like, oh, it's cheap eats, it's all this. Like, no, like there's, there's a legacy, there's sweat, there's grit that goes into all of this. And these are the stories that we should be sharing. And many of them may not have digitalization or like tech access in the way that we're used to. So be able to use your platform um, and, and share out, you know, what are their stories? What's your favorite meals? Why do you like coming here? So that people could discover. Um, the other thing I've learned in the past year is how local politics are so, so important. We think of politics at the federal and at the national level. Um, you should be paying attention to, you know, for New York City in particular, there's going to be like a crazy election in um, like a month and a half now, city council, mayor, um, Manhattan, like all the DAs, borough presidents, um, those local, like local politi politicians have so much power to shape certain policies um, that if you really want to see change, if you want to talk about, you know, what Brandon was saying, think about government, then you have to pay attention because the government's not going to listen if you're, if you're not electing, you're not voting, you're not sharing your voice. Um, so just, you know, real, real quick, a really practical example, half of Chinatown was left out of um, a $37 million loan opportunity for hard hit neighborhoods in um, New York City. And you know, we were like, why? And it's because that zip code, um, it was ne neighboring to Soho and they used median income. Soho is a higher income than Chinatown. And it's literally, that's the result of gentrification. So that's why 50% of this, this neighborhood couldn't apply for this loan. Um, we did a letter writing campaign to the commissioner, um, our state assembly or city council, and we got a ta Asian task force set up. Um, you know, unfortunately by then the, the funds had, um, had dried out and you know, we weren't able for this round, but it, it shows you that there were, you know, 
people are listening. You know, just having your social media or being able to write to your local elected makes a difference. Um, so there, there's a power in numbers. So if more of us can pay attention to local politics, I think like that's, that's our part. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I echo everything Victoria said. And I, I think to add on, um, you know, in, in terms of, so there's the hard, you know, just show up, be there, go support these businesses, go, support, go get to, to know these businesses. Um, and when you're there, be there with the intention of, or just with curiosity, be there with the intention of not thinking of it as any different from any other community. You know, that, I think that's, that's really important. And a lot of, you know, what we want to try to do is to ensure, you know, come up with ways to ensure that our AAPI communities are seen, are celebrated, are, you know, recognized um, as being human beings. <laughs> and um, it's, it's crazy that we have to, you know, keep doing that, but it, it's important. And, um, and so use your creative, your creativity to, to ensure that, or to, you know, to make that happen um, in whatever capacity you can. And, and like I've mentioned before, it was, it's so inspiring to see so much of our audience do that and, and come forth and share their stories, um, build those connections. Um, and so, so I think, um, yeah, tap into that creativity. That's really what is, you know, I, I think that, that using creative media helps to communicate across so many gaps and, and you know, divides. And so, um, yeah. Well, I'm gonna ask you in a minute, Daphne, to use your creativity and also to bridge a divide. Um, as <laughs> I'm talking, I'm gonna be inviting our original three uh, speakers to come back and join us and to start thinking about what I'm gonna ask you. We have only a few minutes. Um, I literally, in all of the maybe hundreds of Zooms that I've been on throughout the pandemic, um, I have to tell you, this is by far the one I have felt the time has gone the fastest and that breaks my heart because I would love for it to go all night. I could talk to all of you literally for the rest of the next week, but Brandon's all suited up. He's got to go into service um, and all good things must come to an end. So in these last um, few minutes that we have together this evening, I would love if we could start to think about whether or not as a collective and individually, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful for the future of Chinese food in America? And if so, what is your hope? What is your hope to see the future of Chinese food in America, of Asian food in America, um, and specifically of Chinatowns throughout the Americas, throughout the United States? Uh, and with that, I know I kind of threw a lot at there, but I like to end on a note of hope not to gloss over uh, what we are collectively being challenged with, which is just, you know, one thing stacked on another uh, between the pandemic and the anti-Asian racism and the lack of awareness, as Vic was alluding to about what's happening in local politics. I mean, it's just a lot, a lot stacked on top of each other. Um, but I like to end on a note of hope because I think it gives people the motivation to go to act, right? To do the, these things that we've been talking about, to be called to action. So I'm gonna ask Daphne uh, if she would like to do a little speaker tag and bridge the gap between uh, the beginning and this closing part of our program. Uh, Daphne, who do you wanna hear hope from? I would love to hear from Grace, who is my uh, cookbook hero. Thank you so much. I actually have your cookbook right next to my desk right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I'm very flattered. Thank you for that nice <laughs> plug for my book. Um, I would say that um, in the last year, I've spent so much time in Chinatown and I have really fallen in love with it more than ever. And I've discovered things that I never knew before. There is a, uh, 
friend of mine, Jan Lee, who's born and raised in New York's Chinatown. And he said to me, you can live in Chinatown your whole life and not know it. And I, I keep on discovering new and precious things. Um, so many of the businesses are, are mom and pop. I think Wellington can correct me on the figure. I think it's 94% or 98%. The rest of Manhattan, south of 96th Street is completely gentrified. I do not know how Chinatown held out all this time. And so many stores and restaurants are just from a bygone era. It's charming, it's pre-digital, it's real, it's gritty. There's a restaurant called Mi Sum on, um, in Cantonese we say Mi Sum on Powell Street. They have the original 1967 cash register. Ting's, a souvenir store on Powell Street also, like dates from 1958 or 59. I think it's the last souvenir store in America because all the other ones are kind of junky t-shirt mugs and all that. And so um, go to Chinatown, go to your local Chinatown, your local uh, AAPI businesses and support them. And there's so much to learn and to discover and you will fall in love as I have, again, with the community and appreciate the fact that Chinatown is not just a bunch of shops and restaurants that's great for eating, but they're historic, immigrant communities that tell the story of what it means to be American. So many of the businesses are started by immigrants that just came to this country with nothing and through pure grit, you know, carved out little businesses and they are part of the American dream. Um, so support them and you will feel better and you'll enjoy great food and great experiences. Thank you so much, Grace. I am uh, feeling a pull in my soul to hear a little bit of Brandon's hope because I know he's going to go into service. And um, Brandon, are you hopeful? Yeah, hopeful for sure. Um, I think uh, I think you know a big part of even opening Mr. Jews was was based out of my love for that I had here still, um, or had when I was growing up. And um, so my hope is that, that um, we will continue to have businesses that, that um, uh, kind of show uh, um, really like uh, craftsmanship and uh, really show um, the history of, of, the, of the neighborhood um, for another generation. Um, you know, I, I think uh, having <clears throat> um, Chinatown in San Francisco to me is really a, a community that is that is um, uh, exemplifies like a lot of the struggle of of um, immigrant America, um, but its success has been something that I think gives hope to a lot of other immigrants um, that are not Asian uh, that that a community can, can actually be successful here. Um, and um, I think uh, I, 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 the stories of, of Chinatown um, are, are really insane. And so um, my hope is that we can really continue to look at the, at the stories that, that um, provide that hope. Um, there's plenty of other ones that, that um, are, are really dismal too. Um, but I think it's really important for us to, to have uh, this hope that Chinatown will not only come back, uh, but it would come back better than ever. Um, and, and that um, as a community that we're stronger, um, you know, inside and outside of Chinatown. Um, so that's my hope. You know, I did just uh, have one more thing I wanted to ask you, Brandon, because uh, one of the things that has struck me recently is that I noticed that food writers are a little bit more on eggshells than they've been. And as I was reading uh, one of the pieces, one of the reviews of your book, and I assume it wasn't the only one, there was a great pain made to say how this is not a book for uh, the inexperienced home cook, you know, and uh, you really need to kind of have your planning and it's really a chef's cookbook. I'm curious to hear from you. 
why was that important to you? Because actually one of the topics that we're going to be addressing later in the culinary uh, culinary Colonasia series uh, is about this stereotype of Asian food being quote unquote fast, ethnic, cheap, casual. Um, and, you know, Wellington's been talking a lot about volume and how a lot of these restaurants require volume to survive. Why was it important to you that the cookbook that you put out be complicated? I mean, actually, it's even less complicated than some of the things that we actually do. In, in, in the restaurant, but I tried to make some, I, I want the book to be used too. Um, but like, as you know, a chef that has trained under other cuisines, um, I think having maybe an assumption that, that Chinese cooking is, is fast and easy, um, I, I could see how people could think that. Um, but the more I've gotten into studying Chinese um, uh, cuisine and, and the history and the technique, um, the approach, the um, execution, um, it is, it is by far um, the hardest cuisine that I've ever studied. Um, and um, it's so vast. Uh, it's, it's, it's it really um, between all the regions within even mainland China, um, you can look even in America's um, uh, influence. on Chinese cuisine or Chinese influence on a really interesting um, food that has developed over over the course of um, of time here. So um, I think I wanted to really give a glimpse of some of the observation, some of the technique um, that 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 is part of even just a seemingly like very like our the fried chicken uh, that actually came was the recipe of Four Seas which was a restaurant that was here for 50 years before me. It's their recipe um, pretty much verbatim. Uh, there's a, a couple little substitutions that I made, but the technique is the same. You look at the chicken, it looks like a fried chicken, but to know that it was actually blanched, um, marinated, air dried um, for you know, a day and then, and then fried to get it that kind of crispiness is un, unlike any other kind of fried chicken that you'll get. Um, those kind of techniques that that aren't as um, maybe uh, um, even published, um, uh, it was important for, for me to make sure that um, there was a, a deeper understanding to the complications and the really like beautiful like um, parts of, of Chinese cuisine. Uh, it's very intricate and it's very layered and it's not easy. Um, so uh, everything has a lot of, you know, everything has so much purpose in Chinese cuisine, whether it's how something's cut or what the meaning of uh, the two together means. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, I will be studying Chinese food for, for the rest of my life and, and, and not uh, really even scratch the surface of, of really um, uh, what it takes to, to make something um, perfect, uh, but um, I'm fascinated, and I, I hope that um, you know the book can just be a glimpse into uh, really how how vast and how um, how how delicious Chinese food is. Well, for those of you who don't know, uh, I I read that your book also includes um, a recipe that requires a bicycle pump. So that's the one that I'm going to start with uh, when I get the book here uh, and start cooking. But I also want to hear from Vic. Vic, what is your hope? And now that you've been working during this time, what's your hope for the future of Chinatown? Um, I think it's the like conversation and the dialogue, I mean, where it is about elevating the community and um, exactly what Grace and Brandon have echoed and you're seeing beyond, right? Like surface level and you're, you're thinking about, um, you're, you're, we're elevating the cu cuisine, right? We're, we're putting faces to the business owners. Um, and also, you know, the silver lining too, um, 
some of these discussions have been, I, I've had really active conversations with my friends around hate and what does it mean? What does it feel like, right? What is going on in the community? Like talking about these emotions that um, I think a lot have been maybe like suppressed or they're uncomfortable conversations that we have, um, that we have to have um, trickling down into about like review culture. How do we review, how do we view review culture for ethnic enclaves? Um, which can be so detrimental and like we've, we've seen that. So I think that um, I'm, I'm really hopeful for this type of dialogue that I feel like is going to press for change. Um, and that's where I feel like really confident too, that you know, it, it's going to lead to um, more systemic change and not just something that we'll see in like a moment. Do you also feel hopeful, Wellington? Is it just in this moment, or are we gonna keep? Uh, are we gonna keep supporting these Chinatowns? Are the people that aren't here with us speaking on the panel? Uh, are do you think they're in it? Are they? Are you getting some buy-in? Uh, Simon, absolutely. I can bet my bottom dollar on it, and it's a summary of what all the speakers just talked about. Uh, if you read Angela uh, Lead uh, Duckworth's book about grit. Um, the one thing I give credit to all these, not just Chinatown, but also Little Italy, the Harlem restaurateurs, uh, Malba came all the way from Harlem to support Chinatown. And you may not notice, uh, to Daphne's point about building coalition, uh, David Rockwell donated more than half a million dollars of outdoor seating to us and donated to Harlem. The Harlem restaurateur like you came down and bought our food and brought it back up to Harlem and brought her staff with it. And then says, I'll be back for more. And then Little Italy, you can see our campaign is that we reach out to Little Italy. They are in it as much as they. So it's about this multi-layer option of coalition that is all have the same, same common goal. There is not enough time for hate. Life is too short. And to the point about what, what uh, Brendan is talking about uh, and Grace is talking about, Imagine just in Chinatown alone, you cannot even understand. You could be there 40 years, not experience the 300 restaurant I have. Now imagine I take you to China and that's 4,000 years of cooking that a mountainside that most Chinese have never even seen it. That you had to shred, you had to dice, you had to knead it, you had to prepare it with the stone, you had to uh, push hard, you can do hand pull noodles. Every year we do the hand pull noodle at Metropolitan Museum. The line goes out the workshop. The kids love it. Right. And so I, I, but the fundamental, the reason I mentioned Angela Lee Duckworth is that the, she is an expert on indication of success. How do you measure all the competitors? Which one will outlast you? Which one will be there? And you know what it is? Teddy Roosevelt. You're in it for the fight. You're in it for the long haul. You don't give up. You look at the Chinese, the way they have been, look at all the things, they adapted, they uh, they start bagging the, the dumpling to sell as a grocery, they, they start doing delivery, all the, the and we can sh see how quickly they shifted. I went from 312 restaurants down to 29 last April. Now I'm back up to 260 something, right? And so you can see that the resiliency, that, that determination, that not willing to give up, that I will bite the bullet and go through it. Together with all these Vic and, and Welcome to Chinatown, all these people that are wanting to support, I have no doubt about the future of Chinatown. And more importantly, Chinatown is going to be the Columbus Circle of Lower East Side because the Second Avenue subway eventually will open right in the heart of Chinatown where seven streets come together. There will be a mini Columbus Circle and you can, you can wait to celebrate that day, which I wish we could live uh, several thousand years to see that time. I hope that all of you live several thousand years because I have so many more questions and I have so much more um, Really, the meals are what I'm looking forward to sharing with all of you the most. Um, and I want to thank you for such an engaging and insightful conversation. Uh, thank you specifically. While we have our interpreters here, we can give a virtual round of applause since we can't all hear and see each other uh, to Grace Young, to Brandon Ju, to Wellington Chen, Vic Lee, and Daphne Wu. Um, and I also want to thank again the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, which is initiated by, uh, administered by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, APAC. Uh, thank you both for making this program possible and for making 
all of my dreams come true to talk to all my cousins and aunties um, and to be here with all of you. Our next program is also very, very, very close to my heart. It is called Southeast Asia Got Something to Say. Uh, it's a cultural reference to a very important moment in my other uh, personal culture, which is hip hop culture uh, as American, as Asians in America, um, that said the South got something to say. And that's all I got to say about that. It's an outcast quote. And our program is uh, entitled Southeast Asia Got Something to Say, uh, because at this moment, uh, pre-pandemic and now, we do have something to say through our food, through our cooking. Um, and I know that our a very esteemed celebrity panel on May 19th uh, will get you very excited. We have uh, Jet Tila from the Food Network. We have Christine Ha, uh, who won Master Chef. Um, and we have Pepper Teigen and Genevieve Villamora. Pepper Teigen uh, just released a Thai cookbook and Genevieve Villamora is from our uh, Washington DC and global community of Filipino restaurateurs. So it's a stellar panel. It's on May 19th, same time, different link, but same virtual table. And we have just posted a link to more information in the chat. And before you go, I would love to ask you uh, once again to please complete our survey. We really, really value everything you have to say. We are uh, operating these Kalinasia uh, programs in the series a little bit differently. We're playing with format a little bit because we think it's important if we're going to be talking about the future of Asian food in America, um, that we break the mold sometimes and we just let uh, the people who really have the expertise in these topics be the star of the show. So thank you once again on behalf of all our partners for Kalinasia. And I hope we'll see you on May 19th. And I'm wishing you all a fantastic evening. I hope you've eaten. If you haven't eaten yet, happy dinner, happy lunch, wherever you are in the world. And I hope we'll see you on May 19th. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone.